All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice exam series. Today, we are continuing with another set of questions that we'll go over together and break them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please subscribe for all of our updates. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, please let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. A behavior analyst is implementing a new behavior intervention plan for a student with aggressive behavior. The staff responsible for implementing the BIP includes teachers, aides, and other support personnel. During the initial phase of the intervention, the behavior analyst notices that the staff members are not consistently following the specified steps of the plan, which could jeopardize the outcome. To maintain high procedural integrity, what actions should the behavior analyst take to ensure the intervention is implemented as designed? All right, we have a long question, but we're not going to panic with long questions. We're just going to take our time and attack the question and understand what it's asking about. And the essence of this question is about procedural integrity. With procedural integrity, we're trying to make sure everything we're writ we've written as far as our treatment goes and the process goes is being implemented correctly. And so to maintain procedural integrity, we're going to train, we're going to monitor, we're going to reinforce over and over and over again. Now, this analyst wants to ensure their intervention is implemented as designed because the staff responsible for the BIP includes a bunch of different people. So you've got a large team here. And the analyst is already noticing that the members are not necessarily following the specified steps. So what we want to do is address this early and attack it before it becomes a bigger issue. So what should the analyst do to maintain integrity? A, collect baseline data before the intervention begins. Now, baseline data is going to tell us about the target, but it's not going to help us necessarily with the procedural integrity. So is there a better option? B, regularly observe and provide feedback to the staff implementing the BIP. Absolutely. This is the best way to provide or ensure procedural integrity. Make sure you are giving enough supervision and frequently enough so you can always be up to date on how things are running and how things are going. Remember, you're writing these BIPs, you're writing these treatment plans. You want to ensure they're done correctly. C, modify the BIP based on staff preferences and convenience. We really should never be modifying things based on preference and convenience of our staff. Now, occasionally, right, we're, we don't want to make things unbearable or too difficult, but it's really about what's best for the client. And then D, ensure that the student understands the purpose of the intervention. That might help the student better understand why we're working with them. But we're worried right now about the teachers, the aides, and the personnel. And so what we want to do to make sure they're doing everything correctly is to regularly observe and provide that feedback to the staff implementing the BIP. Marge believes that she is witnessing some possible ethical violations with one of her behavior technicians that she supervises. She does not believe any harm has been caused to the client or stakeholders, but she fears that harm could happen at some point soon. What is the first step Marge should take to resolve any ethical issues in this particular scenario? So we have an ethics question and how we should address ethical violations or potential ethical violations. So we have Marge who wants to resolve this situation. So far, she thinks she's seen ethics violations with one of her technicians. So not another BCBA, but her own supervisee. So this is even more important because as a BCBA, as a behavior analyst, you're responsible for your supervisees. You can't claim you didn't know. If you're supervising them, you're responsible. Now, she doesn't think any harm has been caused, but she fears harm could happen at some point. What should Marge do first, both as a good supervisor and as a good behavior analyst? A, Marge should address her concerns immediately with her supervisee. Yes, open communication, prompt communication is crucial. When ethics violations occur, as long as no harm has been done, the first thing you want to do is try to resolve it with the person you think is committing that ethics violation. That should be number one. If you can't resolve it, then you can either say you've done your best or you can escalate it. But the first thing, first thing we want to do is address it with the person we think is committing the violation, especially with technicians who may not know better. B, Marge should reprimand her supervisee for the ethical violations. 
She should not. She should not jump to punishment, especially when she's not even sure if it's occurred yet. C, Marge should address her concerns directly with the supervision board. It's not there yet. She needs to go to the supervisee first because she is responsible for that supervisee's actions. And then D, Marge should wait a few more days to see if the ethical violations actually exist. Very rarely should we wait and see, especially if she thinks harm could happen. Waiting and seeing is not a good strategy. She wants to take action. And to take action, she's going to address her concerns immediately with her supervisee. That is fulfilling her role as a trainer, as a manager, as an analyst, however you want to look at it. As the analyst who's responsible for the supervisee, she needs to address it immediately and take responsibility and then possibly train the technician. Or if that doesn't work, then she can go ahead and escalate it. In a multiple baseline across settings design, which of the following is the primary reason for staggering the introduction of the intervention? So we've got an experimental design question and we're talking about multiple baseline across settings. The question wants to know, why do we stagger the introduction of the intervention? What do we mean by that? Well, with our multiple baseline designs, we've got, let's say three baselines running concurrently. We're only gonna introduce the intervention for one of those baselines at a time. And why do we do that? What's the purpose of staggering those interventions? Why don't we just introduce all the interventions to all the settings all at once? A, to demonstrate that changes in behavior are due to the intervention rather than to other variables. Yes, if we have a situation where we have three baselines and I introduce an intervention and that baseline, the data change. But then I notice in my other baseline conditions, data are also changing. That doesn't make sense, right? Because the only data that should be changing are the ones that are being intervening on. And so if we see that all of our baselines are changing, even though we've only used intervention in one of them, that should give a, a warning sign that we need to investigate and make sure that we're still controlling for any extraneous or confounding variables. What about B, to allow the participant to get used to the intervention in one setting before applying it to another? It's not about getting used to it, right? We're just looking to run the multiple baseline design correctly, which is to stagger the introductions of the interventions. C, to compare the effectiveness of different interventions across settings. When we've got a multiple baseline across settings, we're not using different interventions. We're using different settings. All of our settings will get the same intervention because that's the point. We want to compare it across settings, not different interventions, but the same intervention across different settings. And then D, to ensure that the intervention is effective in the first setting before applying it to others. That's not the main goal here, right? We're looking for control. We're looking that we are controlling that we have control over our change. And to do that, we need to stagger those interventions. And so the primary reason we're staggering those interventions is to demonstrate that changes in behavior are due to the intervention rather than to other variables. A behavior analyst is implementing a complex reinforcement schedule to increase a student's compliance with classroom rules. The schedule involves providing reinforcement after the first correct response following a fixed period of time, with the time period gradually increasing after responses from the student. Which of the following best describes this type of schedule? All right, so let's think about this. We're looking at a schedule question, and we have this complex schedule where we have a analyst providing reinforcement after the first correct response following a fixed period of time. So let's call that a fixed interval schedule. Now, let's say that's a fixed interval too. Each time the, the student responds or student receives reinforcement, that increases. So let's say it just goes out FI3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Let's just say it continues to increase. What type of schedule are we looking at here? A, fixed interval schedule. Now be careful because we are looking at a fixed interval schedule, but it's more complex than that. And why is it more complex than that? Because we're systematically increasing it after responses from the student. So we need something a little more complex than just fixed interval. We know it's not a variable interval because it's a fixed period of time. That's a key word there. We're looking at a fixed period of time. It's not a fixed ratio because ratio has to do with responses. We're dealing with time. So what we're looking at 
is a progressive interval schedule. We've got an interval schedule that is gradually progressing as our client goes. So this is a complex reinforcement schedule that we don't talk about a lot, but you want to be familiar with. And it's pretty intuitive, right? We're progressing the interval schedule as we go. So it's not overly challenging, but it's one of those that we don't discuss a whole lot. So we're trying to bring you into a deeper state of knowledge about reinforcement schedules. And so this schedule would be considered a progressive interval schedule. Your wife gets into an Uber, leaving the airport. She shares her trip location with you, and you follow along as her car gets closer and closer to the destination. What are you likely using to track how long until you see your wife? Very easy question, right? Now, on your exam, you're going to have easy questions. And the worst thing you can do is overthink them or say, well, that's too easy. Because some of them are just going to be easy. And if you've prepared, a lot of them might be easy because you're going to be fluent, you're going to be ready. So when you get an easy question, we're not overthinking it. Respond, trust your preparation, answer it, move on. So we know your wife gets into an Uber and you're following her as she gets closer and closer to the destination and you're tracking how long until you see your wife. So what are you using? A, latency. Well, latency would be the SD to the first response. And we're not timing in between an SD to the first response. What are we timing? We're timing her trip, the duration of her trip, right? We're not looking at the frequency. We're not counting how many times something happened. We're simply looking at the duration. How long is her trip lasting? How long until we see our wife? And then into response time would be response one or response two. And we're not looking at time in between responses. We're simply looking at the duration of the trip. Again, very simple question. We answer it. We move on. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out or card. Study hard. See you soon.